Welcome everybody and thanks all of you for coming. It's a great pleasure to me to introduce Ramiro Los Fuente. So he's from the University of Queensland and today he'll speak about non-compact Einstein manifolds with symmetry. Thank you, Ramiro. Thank you, Romina, for the invitation and thanks uh, everyone for coming at such a late time for most of you or such an early time for some of you who are in this part of the world. Um, and sorry for the technical difficulties. So apparently uh, my computer thought it was a good idea to reinstall the operating system just 15 minutes before my talk. Uh, so luckily it just finished. So now I can give the talk. Uh, and, and the talk, yeah, it's about non-compact Einstein manifold with symmetry, which is a, a recent preprint that we uploaded to the archive a couple of weeks ago. Some of you might have seen it already. Joint work with Christoph Böhm from Münster. And it's a very long project that we started several years ago. Luckily, we have some results now. And I uh, will start with the definition of an Einstein manifold, right? So what's uh, what do I mean by that? Let me know if you can't read my handwriting or if you can't hear me well, please. And also feel free to interrupt at any time with questions, comments, corrections, anything. So a Riemannian manifold is called Einstein if, uh, what is the Ricci tensor? is a multiple of the metric where this multiple is some real number. So up to rescaling, I can assume that lambda is zero or plus minus one because Ricci is scale invariant. So I'm gonna assume this from now on. And then, uh, well, in, in general, this is a tricky condition, right? In, in higher dimensions uh, for, for negative lambda, there are no obstructions known, but let me just mention briefly that when lambda is one, uh, uh, a slightly direct consequence of this is that the manifold has to be compact. This is due to the theorem of bonnet myers It has positive Ricci curvature. You can estimate the, the diameter. And, and let us move on through to the case that interests us, which is the case where the manifold is not only Einstein, but homogeneous. So what do I mean by homogeneous? Of course, uh, this means that the isometry group acts transitively. So any two points can be mapped into one another by an isometry. And then special things happen if you assume uh, that much symmetry, namely Ricci flat homogeneous manifolds are flat. It was proven in the 70s by Alex Jeski and Kimmelfeld. And so in particular, the, the universal cover, because homogeneous spaces are complete, then the universal cover is um, Euclidean Rn with the flat metric. So you pretty much know what these guys are. Now, in the negative case, the only thing for free to say is that M has to be non-compact. Sorry, no, no need for, for naming the metric here, of course. The space has to be non-compact. Thanks to Bochner's theorem, right? Because compact manifolds with negative Ricci curvature have no continuous symmetries. And in this direction, there's a, there's a conjecture made by Alexievsky in the 70s, and yes, also in the 70s, in the context of studying quaternionic Keller spaces, that refines this last statement quite a lot because not only the manifold is compact, Alexievsky conjectures that if a homogeneous space is Einstein with negative Einstein constant, I normalize it to minus one, then you know what manifold you are in. So M has to be diffeomorphic 
to Rn. And of course, I'm assuming that everything is connected here. So we call this AC, Alexievsky conjecture. And yeah, the main result I want to, to discuss today is a solution to this problem, namely that the conjecture actually holds. And not only that, but uh, from the proof, it also follows that that any homogeneous Einstein space with negative Einstein constant, so any mg as in the conjecture, admits a simply transitive solvable group of isometries. So that means that uh, it's isometric to an Einstein soft manifold. And um, simply transitive here means, well, it's transitive uh, and simply that it's also, the action is free. So essentially M is as a manifold, you know, the, the solvable group itself. Yeah, so this is uh, the, the, the result I, whose proof I, I'd like to explain today. Um, but before I, I move on to, to explaining the ideas for, for proving this, let me mention some previous results regarding the Alexievsky conjecture because it's been open for such a long time, so there are a lot of people worked on that, and there's many beautiful results that we know already. Uh, so to do that, uh, let me so please let me know if there are any questions to this point. Otherwise, I move on to the previous result. Let me introduce some notation so that everything is more convenient and saving more space. So for the homogeneous manifold M, I will choose a group which I conveniently call F, non-standard notation, but you'll see that the reason for that in a second. Uh, I choose an, a closed subgroup of the isometry group, which still acts transitively, and that allows me to present F as a homogeneous space. So here, H is the stabilizer or isotropy uh, subgroup. And since I'm assuming that F is inside the isometry, the action is effective. So this H is a compact subgroup, right? And P is some point that I fix in. And now some algebraic notation. So for F, which is a Lie group, connected Lie group, I will write a levy decomposition on the group level. So I will write F as L times S. So this times means just product inside the group. Of course, algebraically, this is it's going to be on the Lie algebra level, a semi-direct product of something which is a semi-simple maximum semi-simple, semi-simple subgroup, and it's called a Levy factor. That's why it's denoted by L. And S is normal in F, connected, and it's called, and it's maximal with those properties. So it's solvable, sorry, and it's maximal with those three properties, and it's called a solvable radical. And so I just introduced this notation, which will remain for the rest of the talk but will not be used a lot. And so what are some previous results uh, about the conjecture? Well, um, first let me mention that in low dimensions, we knew uh, quite a lot already by the work of uh, Nikonorov and then some joint work with Romina. And, and then more recently by the work of <clears throat> Roy Berishon student of mine here at UQ, sorry. We know that the Alexievsky conjecture holds if the dimension is not, so again, n here is always the, the dimension of the whole space. If the dimension is not too large, so less or equal than 10, with some exceptions, right? <clears throat> Let me say, unless 
M is a semi-simple Lie group and the isotropy is trivial. And I think there's one other exception, but just to give you an idea that these are the, the harder cases, so to speak. Then there's another sort of isolated result by Nikonorov, which I always try to, to understand or generalize without great success. Um, and it's about the conjecture holding for these harder cases. If you assume that the metric, which is a left invariant metric on this semi-simple group L, is awesome. So this uh, terminology invented by Yuri Nikolayevsky, and, and that means that there's a Cartan decomposition of this non-compact semi-simple Lie algebra of L, so that G uh, makes this Cartan decomposition orthogonal. Just a technical condition, and, and it's of course extremely restrictive. Like the set of also metrics is measured zero in the space of all metrics, but but still a very interesting result, in my opinion. And, and then moving on to uh, more recent work by, uh, well, in my PhD thesis, I joined the project by Jorge, which was then extended by Mike Jablonski and Peter Peterson in 18, and then also combining this with the previous work in low dimensions that I mentioned above with Romina, um, we know the following. So we know that if the manifold is simply connected, so I'm assuming that the I'm in the context of the Alexievsky conjecture, right? But if in addition you assume that M is simply connected, then it turns out that we knew you may choose the transitive group F so that there's a geometric Levy decomposition, namely L and S are orthogonal, and the way to write this is that the orbits through one point, their orbits through one point are orthogonal. Moreover, the orbit of the solver of a radical is Einstein, so that's a very nice reduction of the problem, uh, but then you still have to understand what happens with the other orbit. And, and then in the paper of uh, Mike and Peter, the main result is perhaps that the all compact simple factors in L are contained in the in the isotropy subgroup. So you can assume they don't there are no such factors. Finally, and perhaps I'm missing uh, interesting results, but this was what I could remember yesterday. Uh, another result by Mike Jablonski, and combining this with a, a recent paper, so I say recent, it's 2018, but it got accepted a couple of months ago. Uh, if if you take M, G as in the conjecture statement, then you can assume, so then it has to hold that the pi one, the, so the, the manifold is simply connected, right? So in particular, the, all these conditions that I just mentioned above will apply, so that's nice, right? And you can assume that the manifold is simply connected, but then uh, what to do with the, the semi-simple cases, right? So again, let me uh, perhaps before moving on, uh, yeah, recall that the name of the talk is not homogeneous Einstein spaces, but non-compact Einstein manifolds with symmetry. So we will study uh, the Einstein equations under symmetry assumptions which are less than homogeneous. So I now uh, change gears and forget that M is homogeneous. So let's let's assume that it's Einstein with negative Einstein constant, complete because it can be non-compact, but not necessarily homogeneous from now on. Okay. 
And now the, the setup that I want to consider is con a connected Lie group G acting on MG with a number of adjectives, so not adjectives, adverbs, uh, properly, right? So this is a technical condition. It ensures that we have a slice theorem. So most of the things that you know for, for compactly group actions will hold for a proper action of a non-compactly group. That's the work of Palais in the early 60s. Uh, then, uh, of course, I will assume that the action is by isometries. And finally, the most important or the, the most restrictive assumption is that I'm assuming that the orbit space is a closed, smooth manifold. Right. So this is a, 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 an assumption, right? It's not always the case. So in particular, uh, for the experts, and more precisely, uh, we will assume that all the G orbits are principal. So when you have an isometric group action, uh, the orbits come in three flavors. You have the principal ones, which are the, the largest the dimension orbit. Then you have orbits of the same dimension, which are like quotients of the principal orbit. That those are called uh, exceptional. And then the singular orbits of lower dimension. Right? I'm assuming that all the orbits are principal. And then by the sli slice theorem, this implies that the, the orbit space is a smooth manifold. And on top of that, I also assume that this smooth manifold is compact. And this is crucial for our results. Right? If you remove this uh, compactness assumption, so perhaps this is a technical assumption uh, right? that could be removed. Uh, can you see the, the red thing? Uh, it's, it's not looking great, actually. But oh, there it is. OK. Uh, this is a technical assumption. Um, could be removed, but the, the compactness is definitely necessary. Right? And so before I present the, the main tool we use for proving the Alexievsky conjecture, let me also recall that uh, given a new group, G, the new radical of G is by definition uh, its maximal connected, there's a lot of adjectives, nilpotent, normal, subgroup, right? Maximal, nilpotent, connected, and normal, OK. And, and let me recall that the nil radical is trivial precisely when G is uh, semi-simple. So an example of what's the near radical, suppose I have a solvable Lie group G, which is say the group of upper triangular matrices of some size, right? Then the near radical, and then positive entries in the diagonal, the near radical will be the, the group of strictly upper triangular matrices with, with ones on the diagonal. Okay, so this is a, an important subgroup for us because it is in terms of the new radical that we obtain the, the structure results for for this uh, non-compact Einstein manifolds with symmetry. So that brings us to the second result that I want to talk today. And this is the main tool we use for proving theorem A. So theorem B says that in the context I just described, right? So Riemannian manifold, negative Einstein, and there's a group acting uh, satisfying one, two, three above. So properly isometrically, the quotient is those manifold. And I'm also assuming that the new radical is non-trivial. So G is not semi-simple. Then there exists a foliation of M into 
leaves which are pairwise isometric i think locally isometric yes locally isometric uh, and minimal and also einstein with the with the induced geometry sub manifolds of m of dimension the dimension of the new radical plus one okay so this doesn't look great because uh, it's the statement is a bit complicated maybe to sell this theorem besides that it has a very good application let me just say that uh, it is quite general right because we are only assuming that this uh, is an isometric group action but we're not assuming anything about the co-homogeneity or the dimension of the orbit space right so this is why this is so powerful i guess um, and like i couldn't find in the literature uh, any theorems that applied for any isometric action on an einstein manifold in the negative case at least and so so the the good thing is that we can say at least something non-trivial right perhaps that something is not optimal i don't claim this is optimal uh but you, that, that you can say something you know there are some things that vanish some things that are equal to other things under such general assumptions uh, it's it's great news and moreover i mean we can say more than this it's just the statement would look even worse if i added everything but i will add everything so so there's three more things that hold so the leaves of this foliation are invariant under the action of the new radical so the new radical is a subgroup of trees so it also acts isometrically properly although not with a compact quotient anymore but it almost has the same properties so the, the leaves are locally homogeneous and an invariant the n orbits we understand their geometry very well. They are locally isometric to a fixed nil soliton. So a nil soliton is a Ricci soliton, uh, a, a left invariant Ricci soliton on a, on a simply connected nil potent Lie group. Here is the universal cover of n. And they are unique up to isometry because I'm fixing the group N, right? So the geometry of the N orbits is, of course, very well understood, right? And then uh, the, this is extremely important, the N action on M is polar. What do I mean by that? Uh, for the non-experts, this means that the, the distribution defined on M by looking at the orthogonal complement to the tangent spaces of the orbits of n so of course given an, a group action i can look at the tangent spaces to the orbits and that gives me a distribution which i will call the vertical distribution perfectly nice integrable distribution the, the, the integrals are manifolds are the orbits in this case they are all of the same dimensions but if I look at the orthogonal complement, because I have a Riemannian metric, that gives me the horizontal distribution, which is, which is not necessarily integral. So the action being polar is the same as saying that the distribution to this n orbit is integral. That's a condition. And let me just perhaps to connect this theorem to previous work on the the Einstein equation in the homogeneous case, right? So again, I'm not assuming that G acts transitively, but if G is solvable and the action is transitive to assumptions that we're not making, then theorem B becomes <clears throat> Uh, a result by Jens Heber called uh, rank one reduction. 
proved in his habilitation uh, in the context of Einstein solve manifolds. And then uh, the item three that I mentioned above is exactly the same after doing some translations as saying that Einstein uh, solve manifolds are standard. This uh, result by Jorge answering a question by here in the previous paper that I mentioned, published in 2010. So in that in that particular case, we recover this this very nice result. Okay, so now I would like to start discussing uh, what are the ideas involved for proving theorem B. But before that, uh, are there any questions or comments? Have I lost everyone? No, it's great. Okay, well, the, 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 the students, I still see my students, so at least I am connected to, to Australia. Um, thanks for coming, by the way. Look, you didn't have to come. You were supposed to not be working. Um, anyway, so let's move on to uh, the proof ideas for theorem B. Uh, I'm going a bit slow. So, but I don't want to pick up speed in the proof. So, okay, so what's the proof idea? Well, the idea is to use the setup of Riemannian submersions, right? So this is a particular case of Riemannian submersions because, and it is known that under the assumption that I mentioned, given an isometric group action with all of its principles, we have a natural metric on the quotient, which I call B, the base, so that this uh, projection to the orbit space is a Riemannian submersion, right? So let me explain that briefly. I have a picture here so that I don't have to draw it every time. Copy paste. Hopefully this works. Um, oh yes, it worked. So so all right. So we have M, right? And there's a group action G. And the dimensions don't add up because M is at least four dimensional for this picture to hold. But let's just pretend that everything is fine. So these are the G orbits, right? The, the pink things here, right? And when you restrict the metric G to the G orbits, you get a, a metric on each orbit. And now we call this family of metrics G V for vertical, right? So this is a family of metrics on the orbits, one metric per orbit. You can think of this as a family of G invariant metrics on a fixed homogeneous space. And then the projection takes you to this manifold B, which is compact by assumption and smooth, right? And I claim that there is a natural metric on B so that this is a Riemannian submersion. So how do you construct this metric? Well, you look at the tangent spaces to the orbits, and I call these tangent spaces the vertical distribution. Um, and then I said, as I said before, you look at the orthogonal complements with respect to the metric G, right? And those give you uh, subspaces in, in, M, in TM, which I call the horizontal distribution, H. Right? And then, of course, I can restrict the metric G to the subspace H, right? And because the action is isometric, if I do this here at P, or I do it at P prime, or at any other point on the same orbit, the inner product that I will get on the corresponding horizontal subspaces will all correspond via d pi to a unique inner product on the tangent space to b at pi of p, right? So that is this is well defined because the action is isometric, and that gives us the what I would refer to as the quotient metric g, right? So this is a, a very classical construction. And then uh, how do you study such a 
Riemannian submersion, well, let me introduce some notations. So, so for vectors, vector fields on M, which are vertical, namely tangent to the orbits, I will denote them by these letters, and I will use these letters to denote horizontal vector fields. So to study these uh, Riemannian submersions, at least their curvature, you have to consider these two important tensors introduced by O'Neill. Uh, the first one, which we changed the notation, so it might look strange to you, but there's a reason why we do this, by analogy with the homogeneity one case, is uh, the shape operator of the orbit. So it's a tensor of type 2, 1 that takes values in horizontal, vertical, and gives you vertical vector field, which is simply given by this expression, right? So now that x applied the u, comma v. So if you remember, this is uh, precisely plus or minus, I mean, the shape operator of the orbits in the direction, in the horizontal direction x, right? Uh, and of course, it's zero if and only if all the orbits are totally geodesic. And now there's another tensor which is important, which takes takes two horizontal vector fields and gives a vertical vector field, and this is called the A tensor. So this is a classical notation, uh, and it's defined by you take the Levi-Civita connection evaluated at x, y, and then project vertically. So it can be shown that this is the same as looking at the Lee bracket and looking at the vertical projection of these two horizontal vector fields. And that's another uh, important tensor, which is called the, the integrability tensor. And it is zero if and only if the horizontal distribution is integral. So clearly, we're going to be looking at this one later on. And then I guess the local geometry of this Riemannian submersion is encoded in this, so in the family of metrics on the orbits, in the quotient metric downstairs, and in these two tensors, A and L. And finally, because it will be needed later on, but this is not more information, let me just introduce the mean curvature vector of the orbits. Because the orbits can have arbitrary co-dimension, right? So there's one preferred sort of normal vector, and that's the mean curvature vector. I'm changing notation from the paper because I don't have a, a good latex fonts uh, with, my, with my hand. So this is the reason why I use this notation here. So you take a vertical, orthonormal <clears throat> vertical frame, and then you compute this, and you take the horizontal projection, and that's the mean curvature vector. This is just a manifold geometry, right? But it's going to appear in the formula. That's why I mentioned it. All right. So this is uh, the technical information that we need to study this. Uh, I, well. Let me start with the proof of theorem B. Now everyone forgot what theorem B was about. Let me say what step one, what we're going to prove in step one, right? So remember we have a, a, an action of M, of G, sorry, on M, which is Einstein, right? And we want to prove some uh, rigidity conditions. And uh, in step one, we're gonna prove that the N action is polar, namely, that the A tensor is zero, but not for the submersion that I just talked about. I actually have to consider the submersion, which I call pi n, given by the quotient by the n action. So let me call this quotient P, because I don't have enough letters. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Well, it's, it's just another picture. Uh, it's the same construction that I just described. The only difference in the picture is that now the orbit space is not going to be uh, compact anymore. Remember, right? you had the G action and the quotient was compact. 
Now I only look at inside G, there's a subgroup N, which is also non-compact. That's why I draw the orbits as these curves here. Um, now I could look at the N action on M, forget about G, and then only look at the remaining submersion that this induces. Uh, and of course, now the quotient, it's going to have an action of the of G mod N, right? So the quotient, the picture shows this is non-compact. Um, but there's a remaining submersion from the quotient onto B given by quotienting the G mod N action. So this is like obtaining this submersion in two steps, right? First I quotient by N and then I quotient by G mod N. And the reason we have to do that is because the formula for the curvature in the context of the N submersion are better. So we can get more rigidity. And that's why the, the result is stated in terms of this N action. And so what we need to study, right, to prove this is where well, we need to study the Einstein condition in the context of a Riemannian submersion. Right? So luckily there are formulas for that by O'Neill. They may be found in the Bessel book, for instance, chapter nine. I hope I don't have to type them up. Oh, they are there. Okay. Yes. And so I'm being lazy here. Uh, Chess will write two of the formulas that you get from the Einstein condition when you evaluate on two vertical vector fields or two horizontal vector fields. There's also an off-diagonal formula where you choose a vertical and a horizontal vector field, but I'm not going to use that, so uh, I don't write it. Uh, so the, the, the Einstein equation, this is what the, the game is about, is uh, implies these two set of equations. So let me explain briefly what, what are these equations, right? So I'm writing an equation as endomorphisms of, these are endomorphisms of the vertical distribution. And the other equation is an equation for endomorphisms of the horizontal distribution. And whenever I say vertical, horizontal, and all that, I mean for the end submersion from now on. Uh, right, so so the first one says, well, this minus identity is just the Einstein condition, right? This is the Ricci curvature of the orbits of these submanifolds, right? It, of course, depends on which orbit I'm standing at. Right? Then there's a term which is the shape operator of the orbit in the direction of the mean curvature vector. Then there's a term which is quadratic in A, and I, I don't want to define it, but I write it like this to give you the feeling that this is a positive definite, semi-definite term, which is quadratic on A, just some uh, norm, so to speak. And, and then there's this second order term. This is a second order term because remember that L is first order on the metric. So this is second order on the metric. And the way you should think about this is as follows. So if you think of L, you know, one should think of the shape operator as being the derivative of the metrics on the fiber in the direction X. And then this is the second derivative of the matrix. And actually, because I'm taking this uh, xj, xj, this is actually like a Laplacian of the matrix of the fibers, right? So this you should think of as a PDE for the matrix on the fibers involving the Ricci curvature and some other terms, right? Uh, so it's a second order PDE for the matrix on the fibers, uh, which involves the Ricci curvature. Now the other equation uh, involves the Ricci curvature of the base. Also some, well, these are negative definite expressions in A and in L. Uh, now the H where H is a mean curvature vector and the identity coming from G, right? So, okay, so you have these two equations and, and you need to get some information from them. So the idea, how does one extract information from this uh, PDEs is as follows. You find, uh, 
now a g invariant not n invariant but g invariant function f smooth function on m right so that of course because it's g invariant is also n invariant so it gives rise to a function which i denote with the same letter on the quotient by n and you have to find it so that it satisfies a nice uh, PDE, which you obtain using the Einstein equation. Now we second order PDE of the form. This is the Laplacian on P, right? The Laplace Beltrami operator on P. So this is this is the main term, and this is a first order term. It's not important. Uh, and this is greater than or equal than zero for some vector field on P, right? So now the important thing is that this should have been obtained by using the Einstein condition above, right? Now, if you're lucky enough to <clears throat> find such a quantity, then because the function is G invariant, this will induce a similar equation on the base B for the for the function on, on B. Remember, F is G invariant, so it also induces a function on, on the base, right? Remember, B is just M mod G. For some vector field. On B, and now by the maximum principle, this implies that because B is compact, F has to be constant. And therefore, equality holds everywhere. And therefore, hopefully, because you were using the Einstein equation, you, can, you are able to deduce some uh, rigidity conditions from this equality holding, right? So this is a technical idea, so to speak. And any questions about uh, that part? No questions? So Romina, when do I have to finish? How much time is left? So it's one hour in in total. So maybe in ten minutes. So then people can ask five minutes of questions. Ten more minutes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. More okay. or less. Um. Okay. So I will skip the motivation for uh, how do we construct the F. Can tell you maybe later on, but um, I, let me tell you what F is. And, and so F, it turns out that the good F that works is the following. Log of the beta volume plus log V plus one half the norm of H naught squared. Okay, so what are these? Uh, so this is a function on M, which is G in brain. And what are these uh, things here? Well, first of all, remember that the mean curvature vector h, right? Mean curvature vector of the orbits. Now, the mean curvature vector of the orbits, of the n orbits, right? Because n is unimodular, then h can be written as minus the logarithm of, minus the gradient of a function, which I can typically write as logarithm of some function Vn, right? So this is called the, the relative volume of the n orbits. I mean, the n orbits are non-compact, but one can talk about volume forms and then the quotient of two volume forms is a function. So now the problem with this relative volume is that Vn is not G invariant. Right. So in order to overcome that, we write, we consider a, another way of writing H as minus gradient log V, where V 
is a g invariant function but of course we have to pay a price because if if vn is not g invariant then v is not going to be g invariant unless we add something right so we consider this a composition and with the property that the divergence of v times h naught is zero don't ask me why this is a good property but it turns out that this is uh, this works and so this is what we call a modified Helmholtz decomposition for the vector field H, right? Uh, so you write it as a gradient plus something else, and there's something else. It's not divergence free, but it's divergence free if you plug in a V there. And and so that's why that's how we define H naught and V, right? Which are which enter the game here. In, in, we look at the norm of H naught. Now, what is V beta? Well, V beta is the, the beta volume of the of the n orbits. So the beta volume was a quantity that we introduced with Christoph when studying homogeneous rigid flows, uh, which are immortal, and that helped us construct the Lyapunov function. So to give you an idea, it's essentially Imagine a, what, what's a volume form, right? The so volume form, uh, you can write it in coordinates as square root determinant gij times, you know, uh, well, the, the canonical volume form, right? So dx1, which dx, n. The beta volume, so this is somehow what I call the relative volume of the orbit, right? It's determinant gij. The beta volume is a determinant, but where you put weights in the exponents of this determinant, right? And the weights come from geometric invariant theory. So GIT stratification of uh, the variety of the algebras gives you some weights which are rational numbers, positive rational numbers. So R is a dimension of N, right? So given the Lie algebra of N, I obtain by the GIT considerations this list of rational numbers, and I use them to, uh, to define the beta volume, right? So to define the beta volume, you take your metric, your vertical metric at P, which is a left invariant metric on N if you want, right? And you write it in terms of a background left invariant metric on N, where you use this T, you can choose T, I guess I can, I have to put two T's here, T to be lower triangular. I can always choose such a T to write any metric in terms of a background metric, right? And if I do that, then on the diagonal, I will have the eigenvalues of the metric in terms of some background metric. And then the beta volume is defined as the determinant of these eigenvalues. Maybe there's a one half somewhere where you put the as exponents, these weights coming from GIT, right? So it is like a determinant, but with weights. <clears throat> and again, it doesn't surprise us that determinants of the metric work for studying the Einstein equation because the Einstein equation is about the rigid curvature, right? Which is a trace condition. So, so volumes are good for studying rigid curvature. That's the moral of the story. But you have to take the right volumes, so to speak, taking into account the, the geometry of the of the n orbits and so so well we have this function uh, f and it turns out that when you compute its laplacian and you add in this first order term you get exactly the following so you get an expression which depends on the ricci curvatures of the fibers times these beta weights. Then you get an expression involving 
these positive definite terms times the beta weights. And then you get something which is positive. So this is nabla h naught 2 times, well, there's an, some formula. You don't have to look at this formula. But this is non-positive because this is non-positive. This is the crucial GIT estimate. Uh, and the reason why we look at this uh, beta uh, weights, right? They give you this estimate for the Ricci curvature on lefty mathematics on nilpotent D groups. And this is greater than or equal than zero because uh, A star A is positive definite and the beta plus I's are positive weights, uh, positive numbers, right? So then you get what you what you needed, right? This inequality and then by the maximum principle you must have equality and then everything on the right hand side is zero. So in particular, A is zero, right? And, and many other things also are zero. And, and then, well, from that, you can continue the proof, similar ideas. Uh, before I finish, I would like to say a, a few words. So I started five minutes late, right? So maybe I am allowed to, to do yes, five minutes. Yes, yes, you are. Yeah, yeah, um, you five minutes. So let me... <clears throat> So hopefully that gives you an idea of the ingredients for the proof of theorem B. But let me come back to the proof uh, theorem A, which is the uh, main application. And let me assume that uh, we are in the case where M is, where the group F is semi-simple. So this is a quotient of a semi-simple E group by a compact subgroup H. <clears throat> semi simple. You can think L as say S and N R if you want, whatever. Now to apply theorem B, we consider uh, an Eva Sawa decomposition for L. I'm gonna assume L is a linear semi simple so that K here is maximal compact subgroup and G is a solvable, simply connected solvable subgroup, and they do not intersect. Right. Now, G, so I'm assuming, so assume L mod H has an L invariant Einstein metric. Okay, then we have to prove that this is a solved manifold. Um, so we use the, the, the isometric action on, of G on L mod H because G is a subgroup of L, so it also acts on L mod H. And the quotient, which I denoted by B, is of course uh, is, uh, diffeomorphic to K mod H because L mod G is uh, K. So, so this is a compact, and the action of G is free, and the quotient is a compact smooth manifold. Right? So therefore, theorem B applies, and I obtain some rigidity conditions, namely uh, that A equals zero for the n submersion, that the mean curvature vector as a vector field on the P, the quotient by N is parallel, and that LH is minus beta plus, and also the N orbits <coughs> are locally isometric to near solitons, right? So all this is true. And this is, of course, information that we didn't know uh, before, right? So trying to use this condition, uh, we we prove this lemma, which is an algebraic formula for the Ricci curvature. So suppose I take a point P, E, H, the origin in this homogeneous space. Now you choose killing fields, E, I, 
in the Lie algebra of L. So they are not the basis of L, they are a basis of TPM. And suppose that they contain a basis of N, the Lie algebra of N here, okay? And, and now the assumption is that these killing fields at the point P, they form an orthonormal basis of TPM. Remember M, L, mod H. Right? So these are not dimension of L vector killing fields. These are just dimension of M vector fields. Then we can obtain the following formula for the Ricci curvature of the, of the homogeneous space. And let me write the simplified version. So the scalar curvature of the N orbits at the point P plus here comes a sum of Ricci curvatures of M, but since we are assuming that the Einstein equation holds, then I can simplify this term as just a natural number. This equals by just by using this one condition here, some expression, geometric expression involving the EIs and the mean curvature vector H. And then there's another term, which luckily we can get rid of, but I wanna write the precise formula. And okay, so we get an algebraic formula, algebraic because it's evaluated on killing fields, right? That uses the condition A equals zero, right? Now, this last term here can be made to vanish if we choose the EIs wisely. Because you can, I mean, you can choose EIs so that the add of UJs are nilpotent endomorphisms. So, and this is similar to a trace of add UJ squared, not quite, but believe me that this can be done. And now, by using that the n orbits are nil solitons, this term can be computed explicitly and it turns out to be equal to the sum of these beta weights. This was known. Once you have a nil soliton, you can compute the, the scalar curvature. Okay, and now the, to finish this off, you choose a killing field A in the Lie algebra of this A here, such that its value at the point P is minus the value of the mean curvature vector, which is not necessarily a killing field, right? So in order to get an algebraic expression, and then we end up getting the following, I just rewrite what we had up there, right? But now we use this A because by using A, we can compute this because the levi civita connection on killing fields is well understood. You, you get the, this expression with the Lie bracket, right? And this is like a trace of add A, right? But not quite, but you can also assume that the EIs are eigenvectors of add A. And now add A, goes from L to L, right? Now I want to decompose L as N minus plus L zero plus N, right? So N is comes from Ibasawa and N minus is just the, the Cartan involution applied to N and L naught is the centralizer of N inside L. Um, and the good thing is that by the condition two, this condition precisely, you can compute add A when restricted to N. And you know that add A restricted to N has eigenvalues given by the betas, right? So on L naught, of course, 
al a is zero. And now the question is what happens here, right? But using that theta is a Cartan involution, so it's an automorphism. In fact, you can compute the eigenvalues here. And remember that trace has to be zero, right? So it's not surprising that the eigenvalues are going to be given by minus the, the beta weights. This is a general fact in any uh, non-compact semi-simple Lie algebra. Um, once you know the eigenvalues of N, on N, you know the eigenvalues on N minus. All right, but then let's look at this formula, right? This formula says this partial trace equals the sum of all beta i plus. But how can you look at the partial trace of this giving you the maximal possible sum? Well, you need to not take any of these negative terms here, right? So this equation here implies that um, the subgroup with Lie algebra L not plus N acts transitively. And then because this subgroup has a compact Levy factor by the result of uh, Mike and Peter, uh, you can conclude that uh, there exists a solve, solvable Lie group acting transitively. And yeah, this is the end of the proof idea. And I went over time, so sorry for that. And again, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Lamira. Thank you, Ramiro, for the beautiful talk. Um, is there any question or comment for, for Ramiro? So, Wolfgang, yeah, he has a question, but uh, the micro is not, is not working. Oh, there. Yeah. Can you see the chat, Ramiro? I, I see the chat, yes. Um, what if there are no singular orbits but some exceptional orbits? Um, we are working on that. So we believe that uh, the the all principal orbits assumption should not be necessary. Uh, and I guess with only exceptional orbits, yeah. The only thing is that in order to construct this uh, modified Helmholtz decomposition. Yes, yes, it, but the, the thing, to get the rigidity, you need the, you need the function satisfying the nice PDE inequality, right? And the only problem is that to construct that uh, F that I mentioned here, we use something called this modified Helmholtz decomposition, right? And in order to prove the existence of this decomposition with this property, uh, we need to solve a, a PDE on the base, on B. And now if B is not smooth, then, well, I'm not quite sure how to solve that PDE. But presumably, this is just a technicality. This is clearly not our strongest suit, right? Uh, but, well, um, <clears throat> if one could suppose that the group is unimodular, then you not, don't need this part. If the group G is unimodular, you don't do it on the section. Yes, that's an idea we had, yes. But that, for that, you need the polar, right? And to get polar, you need the rigidity. So, of course, if we assume polar to begin with, then clearly you can do it upstairs on the section, yes. Um, maybe there's another way of approaching this which doesn't need to solve the, the PDE. I mean, the maximum principle argument would be fine because if you prove that your function has the right behavior when you go to the boundary, then you still conclude that there must be a maximum inside. And then that gives you the uh, rigidity, right? But uh, I didn't see the last one. What was that? Uh, any conjectures for that? Uh, no, no, I guess uh, not, not that I would like to make on a recorded talk. 
Is there any other question for Ramiro or comment? You can ask more questions if you want, Volgan. <laughs> Thank you. Is there any other question or comment? It's a question by Alejandro. Oh. <clears throat> the process, well, I don't know, it's just working a lot. <laughs> um, I think it's important to have uh, collaborators who, ha who don't agree with what you think. Uh, and then from that, those discussions, I think that's where most of the most interesting mathematics come from. This all started when we considered the homogeneity one case, which is a previous paper. Uh, so we did essentially the same uh, as, uh, as we did in this paper, but assuming the action is homogeneity one, and that's like the baby case, so to speak. And the reason we, we consider this is because Christoph wanted to understand some situation where the group was SL2R and and you have the homogeneity one action. And I thought this is, of course, trivial. There's no, we shouldn't waste time on this. But once we understood the SL2 situation, then the, the homogeneity one result was clear. And then two or three years later, uh, we, we could tackle this. So, so I think it's important yeah, to, to, to listen to people who disagree with your point of view and try to understand why they do so. And I guess another thing that Jorge always said uh, when, when I was a student, he told me, you need to try to find the estimates that, that can be true. You know, don't throw away a lot because then you're not going to get anything interesting. Right. So so that's perhaps how the technical part. Um, yeah, you try to find estimates that throw away precisely what you would like to throw away, you know. Yeah. That's cheating, so to speak. No, assuming that, okay, I would like this to be zero, that you have a feeling, you know, this should be zero. Try to find an estimate that only uses that that is zero in the rigidity case. Uh, yeah. But yes, other than that, just hard work. Any other question or comment? Well, if not, we can thank again to Ramiro. Thank you. Mm -hmm.